Welcome back to our another episode of Globe Interviews. This is Sarah here. Today we have Professor Zheng Xiao come to our podcast. Please welcome Zheng Xiao. The Globe mobile app is now live on the Apple App Store. Trade anytime, anywhere, with any asset as collateral. Stay connected with all your positions on the go. Globe exchange everything now even easier. So the first question is: Can you share with us a bit about your background and what made you interest in blockchain? My background is in distributed system. I got my PhD about 20 years ago from Cornell. My dissertation topic was on distributed system. After that, I spent eight years working at various research labs. First at at and Lab Research in Fulham Park, New Jersey. I worked on web caching, CDN, IPTV, network routing. Later, I joined the IBM TJ Watson Research Lab, working on networked system software. Eventually, I got bored and decided to go back to China. Now I'm a professor in Peking University, which is my home university. I got my bachelor from Peking University, so it's oh. great to be back. To answer your question, what made me interested in blockchain? Blockchain is essentially a distributed system powered by cryptography. As you can see, I have worked in distributed system for several decades, and blockchain is a wonderful application to it. That's why I'm interested. Oh, wow, excellent. So um, what's your aim to create your own channel and share those tutorial blockchain videos? The lecture videos are recorded lecture of my blockchain course in summer 2018. It was just after the market hype of blockchain in 2017, when the price of many cryptocurrencies skyrocketed and then crashed. A lot of people began interested in blockchain. Unfortunately, there was virtually no formal blockchain course from big name universities at that time. So we decided to make our course publicly available. It was not easy. We got no funding to support this effort. We bought the video equipment with our own money. The two teaching assistants videotaped the course. They had no experience on video editing before and learned how to do it on the fly. Some audience on Bilibili complained the lecture videos are not polished. No, they are not. We didn't use the professional video taping, video taping service. My other videos are recorded presentation and interviewed at various occasions. We decided to make them publicly available because I'm a faculty member at a public university. I believe education should be accessible to everyone. Not everyone has the privilege of getting into Peking University, but everyone should have the privilege of watching educational video. Yeah, definitely. What's your next step for you and your YouTube channel, Bilibili channel in the next three coming years? I think this, this reminded me some repeated requests from the audience. Can you provide more video? It takes <laughs> so long, it takes several months for you to upload a new video. Uh, I'd love to provide a, a constant stream of videos, but uh, I have a very busy schedule. As a professor, yeah. I have to take care of my own students first. I yeah, teach a computer absolutely. algorithm course this semester. Next semester, in the spring, I will teach a blockchain course. Right now, we are getting into our final exam week. Some students oh. are not on campus due to the pandemic. We have to come up a way for the student to take the exam remotely. To get back to your question, I certainly plan to release more videos on hot blockchain topics in the coming years. I just released an actual video on layer two technology, like roll-ups. By the way, blockchain is not my only research area. I also do a lot of work on machine learning. So my time is somewhat divided. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what are the biggest challenges that you think blockchain technology will, will face in the future? I can say two challenges. One challenge is how to make blockchain technology and application built on top of it easy to use. Right now, many D apps are quite difficult to use, like GameFi. Last year, mm -hmm. GameFi was very hot, but the purpose of most players is to make money, the so-called play to earn, not because mm -hmm. they enjoyed the game. 
This is quite different from traditional multiplayer game. The plot, the video quality is also a bit rudimentary compared to classical AAA game. They are not very polished. The entrance threshold is also quite high. If you want to play Axie Infinity, you need to spend quite some money to buy game props. This problem is not unique to GameFi. Many D apps have a steep learning curve. It takes mm -hmm. a dedicated effort to learn how to use them. If there is no monetary incentive, then most people probably are not going to do it. Yeah. Another challenge is performance. Blockchain is an innovative technology, which comes with a significant performance overhead. Many people are talking about Web3 nowadays. Web3 won't happen without performance improvement of the underlying blockchain technology. The evolution of the internet from Web1 to Web2 to Web3 doesn't happen overnight. It's not like today we're on Web2 and tomorrow we'll be on Web3. It yeah. doesn't work that way. If mm -hmm. we look back in history, what's the difference between Web1 and Web2? Some people say Web1 is a passive web or read-only web, and Web2 is an interactive web with lots of user-generated content, like the UGC in Facebook, in YouTube. So why didn't we have Facebook or YouTube in the Web1 era? It's not because the people lack innovative ideas at that time. Actually, we had BBS in the Web1 era, so it was not completely passive. I believe people always have good ideas, or you can say crazy idea. A fundamental reason is the network performance at that time cannot support high volume traffic required by application like Facebook or YouTube. I remember when I worked at at t Lab 20 years ago, at t WorldNet still served a lot of dial-up customers. What if you tell them, hi, I have a great idea, you can watch streaming video on the internet, like in Netflix. They probably will tell you, sorry, we don't have the bandwidth in last mile. I believe we are in a similar situation right now. People have good ideas for DF, like decentralized exchange, DeFi, mm -hmm. GameFi, and uh, most recently, like social fi. But the performance of Ethereum is a bottleneck. That's why mm -hmm. we have seen the surge of various Layer 2 technology and a new blockchain like Aptos, and also the upgrade of Ethereum itself. It finished the merge last September and probably will go through sharding in the future. Yeah. So, like, technology is not like a, it happens in one day. You have to take a lot of effort on it. Some people still think the Web3, like most of people, I would say, uh, think Web3 is a kind of a buzzword. They don't really sure is it Web3 is really happening in the world right now? Because it's not like a phone. Like everyone use phone. Everyone know how to use phone, even the old people. But Web3 is kind of like, it's a trend. I would say it's a trend, but still it's not like a go through in our routine, in our basis life. So what's your it's opinion? It's not used, essentially. Yeah, That's the problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, so next question is, do you think blockchain technology um, is important for the future development of the various in industries and why? Uh, yes, I would think so. Uh, the key benefit of the blockchain technology is to establish trust among entities so that they can engage in business transaction, which they otherwise wouldn't be able to do because they don't trust each other. Mm. If you think of eBay, what's good about eBay is it enabled ordinary people to buy and sell stuff in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion on the internet. So eBay also enabled trust. Those people don't know each other and won't be able to conduct transaction without eBay. So in some sense, eBay also established trust with its reputation system and the dispute resolution process. That's a centralized way to establish trust. You have to trust eBay. Blockchain is a decentralized way to establish trust. You don't have to trust anyone. You only need to trust the blockchain technology. Another way of saying this is you need to trust the collective integrity 
of the blockchain community. In Bitcoin, for example, you need to trust the entities with the majority of the mining power will do the right thing. The enablement of the trust is essential to the future development of various industry. The so-called tamper-proof property is also a direct consequence of this. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So some said that blockchain technology could provide the basis for the richer set of financial services. And so do you think blockchain can accelerate financial inclusion globally? That's a tricky question. I would say it's yes and no. So Bitcoin is probably the earliest and the most prominent application of blockchain. It was invented in 2008 during the previous financial crisis. The Federal Reserve at that time implemented quantitative easing, which is a fancy way of saying printing more money. So ordinary people may be unhappy because the money in their pocket depreciated in value, but there was nothing they can do about it. Bitcoin was invented at that time as a digital currency by the people, of the people, and for the people. The total number of Bitcoin is capped, is hardwired in the program. Nobody has authority to issue more Bitcoin than originally programmed. Some people consider Bitcoin as a digital equivalent of gold, which can be used to hedge against inflation and the unilateral monetary policy by the central government. Unfortunately, I don't think it has served that purpose very well. The price of a Bitcoin mostly move with the stock, stock market. So it's not really a safe haven during the market turmoil. The situation is not getting any better in the current financial crisis. So I define the current financial crisis as whatever happened since the pandemic began in 2020. The Federal Reserve this time had been far more aggressive in printing money. Mm -hmm. It created a huge inflation. We have seen like this year inflation globally like 10%, which is yeah. unimaginable. And that's why the Fed had to raise interest rate so many times this year. Did Bitcoin do anything to alleviate this problem? I don't think so. The price Bitcoin just skyrocketed last year and then crashed. And this problem is not limited to Bitcoin. During the past four years, blockchain technology has been used to enable a richer set of financial services, most notably DeFi. Unfortunately, those services are not mature, not stable, and not safe. The price can fluctuate very wildly and sometimes can get into a death spiral. They are also not easy to use for ordinary people. There mm -hmm. are lots of scam and fraud. So to get back to your question, can blockchain accelerate financial inclusion globally? In the long run, I hope so, but we are not there yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, so let's go to the final questions. Blockchain technology is growing faster in Asia among the West hubs. So um, what's your point of view? Uh, to be honest with you, I'm not sure if this is true. China and uh, the US has a talent pool for the blockchain technology, but they also mm -hmm. have various regulatory constraints. Cryptocurrency is heavily restricted in China. I work and live in China. I'm doing a metaverse project, but we can only do the technical development we cannot participate in anything related to cryptocurrency. We cannot do SEO, IEO, IDO, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. All financial related services have to be handled by overseas team. And I think the US also have some regulatory constraints if you mm -hmm. want to do an SEO. It's not yeah. that easy. It's not as restrictive as in China, but uh, there are still a lot of constraints. Outside China, Singapore is a major hub for blockchain startups, but Singapore mm. is a small country with a small workforce. It is attractive mostly because its regulatory environment is more crypto friendly than both the China and the US. In fact, I think Metaverse is developing faster in the US than in Asia. What's the reason why the regulations getting really strict? 
right now. But before that, there's a lot of big companies growing fast. You mean in Asia or in some other place? And, and in general, like in global, not, not Western and Asia as well. I think it had to protect the people. During the initial days of the blockchain or Bitcoin, there was virtually no regulation because it was a, a new thing. Nobody mm. paid attention to it. Nobody mm. think it will succeed. At least not to the degree it succeeded today. It has succeeded oh. today. So there, there were a lot of projects similar to Bitcoin and they, those projects they died throughout the history. And uh, so initially there was very little regulation. And then when Bitcoin really gained attraction and the people pay attention and spend a lot of money on Bitcoin, I'm sure a lot of people made money on Bitcoin. There are also a lot of people lose money on Bitcoin. So your gain is probably other people's loss. And then the government think they have to do something about it. And I don't think the regulatory environment in China is unreasonable. Right now, mm -hmm. like I have a research team working on blockchain technology. I work with a lot of uh, blockchain company in China, but we worked on so-called permissioned blockchain. So it's, you can see it's cryptocurrency free. We can use the technology of blockchain, but without the cryptocurrency. Some people mm -hmm. think that's fixed. They think some people claim blockchain without cryptocurrency is like the market without money. Well, there is some <laughs> truth to it, but it's not, it's not like we, we are doomed, we cannot do anything about it. There's still a lot of innovative application of blockchain, even if we don't use the cryptocurrency. I actually work with a lot of government organization to develop a project. Like mm -hmm. we also have an NFT marketplace in China, but it's controversial. And the, the regulatory decision is not clear yet. So can you sell NFT? Like if you, e so right now the situation is if you issue NFT, it's not completely illegal, but we restrict the second market for NFT. So we want to avoid a situation, the China, Chinese government want to avoid a situation where you purchase the NFT, not because you like it, but because you, you think you can sell it in the second market at 10 times the price. And that kind of speculative trading is not encouraged in China. So why we should have a more <clears throat> constrained on blockchain technology? Because it's growing faster. It's growing, it becomes gigantic. So it will have an influence to the people's mind if it somehow yeah. goes wrong. And as, as I said previously, there are also a lot of scam and fraud in, in various financial services build on top of blockchain. In fact, I think that some of those services are just the outright fraud. They have not much related to blockchain. They just use blockchain as a, a platform for some gambling or for some uh, money laundering, those kind of services. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Thank you guys for watching today's episode. If you like the content, please like, comment, and subscribe our channel as well. And thank you, Professor Zheng Xiao, come to our podcast. It's really my pleasure to speaking with you today. My pleasure. I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.